David Dawson is our final keynote presentation for our, our Q&A session here. David is a guy that I, in my really my first week, I think, as a marriage and family life director, I was calling around uh, and just asking for consultation and advice from more seasoned family directors. And at that time, he was the Archdiocesan Director of Marriage and Family Life for uh, New Orleans. And it was such a pleasurable, memorable, comforting conversation. And um, Really treasured a relationship him, with him since then. Uh, David is in Louisiana, as I mentioned, he's a Baton Rouge native. Uh, he is married to his wife, Kate. They have eight uh, little and slightly bigger <laughs> children running around their home and one on the way, so nine uh, in total. And uh, so, yeah, they, they win the big family award for this uh, this conference. I don't know if anybody out there uh, beats them with uh, eight, eight out here and, and one on the way, but if you do, type that in the chat and be like, I got 15, he, he's got nothing. Um, Dave is now uh, in the Diocese of Homa Thibodeau, which is another di diocese in Louisiana, as kind of a director of parish support. So really working with parents, uh, with not just parents, with pastors especially, to help them think along lines of mission, uh, along lines of in incorporating culture of prayer and evangelization at every level of their parish. So he is deeply involved in the life of the church and transmitting the saving message of Jesus. He's also, along with his wife, a longstanding uh, member and really a, a leader, national leader in the domestic church families movement, which is an amazing movement, came out of Poland and Dave, uh, along with others, led the translation of the Polish materials into English and it's been, uh, it's been growing ever since they brought it in. Uh, I, we have a couple of circles here in our diocese, one of which our bishop himself is the, the priest moderator on, which is pretty cool. So he's a guy with a wealth of experience, a wealth of, of joy, a wealth of deep commitment to the Lord, and somebody whose advice and, and mentorship I value a lot. So uh, we're going to welcome him in a second. He's joining us from Louisiana, so just give us one quick second to spotlight his video and get our video off, and then he's going to take over and take you through the next 45 minutes to an hour. Thanks. All right. Well, thank you. Appreciate you having me. Uh, it's good to be able to, to jump in on this. I'm, I'm definitely coming from more of a, an experiential background. I don't have a doctorate. I have a, a master's in theology, but that was a while back, and uh, mostly going to be speaking from experience from my own family, but also working with uh, a number of families um, in ministry with marriage and family life. So <clears throat> one of the things I think I know my reaction a lot of times when I hear when I go to conferences or hear uh, some fantastic speakers giving some great information, some great insights, is a mixture of like of hope that these are these are helpful and I want to be able to implement. But also, as I've grown older and and, and had more kids, a combination of like, but I, I'm not sure I can do that. <laughs> and no offense, I mean it's, the fantastic the information is fantastic, but I know myself as a parent. Um, a lot of times my, it doesn't take, it's taken a lot less time after the talk of the conference for me to be like, man, I don't know. I, I'm not sure. I, I know myself and I know what it looks like at home. Um, I know uh, really when it comes to prayer and I know when it comes to how I feel about my wife and my kids, big picture stuff, I feel like I've got it. You know, I feel like I've got some great insights but when it comes to actually, you know, going through the day, I feel like I'm taking shots in the dark. You know, uh, I feel like I'm, 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 I don't have what it takes, you know, uh, I'm, I'm exhausted all the time. And so I think what I want to try to, to, to dig into here with the, the spirituality of parenthood is it's a spirituality that is, as Dr. Tom Quinlan said, it's an absolute mess, uh, that we are a mess. And it's not just messy because our lives are physically messy because the kids are all over the place and, and you know, there, there's stuff everywhere and there's, there's bodily fluids everywhere. Um, but it's messy because uh, we internally are a mess that I'm, I'm weak and my limitations are, are constantly being bumped up against all day, every day. So it's funny, I, I, one of the things when people hear that we've got eight kids with the ninth on the way, um, or they just see us in the grocery store at mass, uh, I, I've, I've learned to read the faces and basically it's always just this kind of shock and awe. And those of you with big families know what I'm talking about. And what comes out is, man, you got your hands full or, you know, if they're being charitable, you got a beautiful family. But um, what I see in their faces is, gosh, how do you do this? Uh, and what I, when it does come out, hey, how do you do this? You know, what I'm constantly saying is in the same way that you do, I, I discovered early on that no matter whether we had one kid or, or nine kids, it's going to kill me. Uh, this is going to kill me. And so might as well go down in flames. You know, our kids are good looking kids and when we have an ugly one, then we'll stop. You know, but either way, I'm going to die and they're going to wear me out. Um, we had we both come. My, my wife's mother is one of 10. My, mom, my mother's uh, one of nine. And so we both know the, the joy of having a lot of people around. Um, when we got married, of course, we were, we had great, uh, expectations that we were going to have a big family and it was going to be fantastic. Then we have one child and it was like, this is nuts. Uh, I, I didn't know how selfish I was. I didn't know how, 
how limited I was in my ability to, to live for somebody else. And uh, now that I want to, now that I'm supposed to, um, I, I'm, I'm constantly bumping up against the fact that I'm bad at this. And uh, at one point, Kate was like, I don't know if we, have, we can have more kids because uh, this child has taken up everything, all that I've got, all of my time, all of my energy, all of my attention. And I, it hit me like, you know, I, I think no matter how many kids we have, they're, they're going to take up all of our time, all of our attention, all of our energy. <laughs> so the idea that like, I mean, you know, we are going to be limited no matter how many we have. Uh, they're going to stretch us no matter how many we have. There's a good uh, friend of mine and a wonderful mentor. He's actually from the Diocese of Pensacola, Tallahassee, uh, Dr. Tom Neal. He now teaches in uh, New Orleans at the, the seminary at Notre Dame. And he's, he's famous for saying that fatherhood gets ripped out of you. It's not something you, you, you necessarily always choose to give, and you can choose more or less so, but mostly it, it happens to you. And I think he's absolutely right. <laughs> I think that that's a, that's a great way of putting it. Um, but I think one of the things that I've noticed about that process um, is that if God's a part of it or not, it tends to be, for the most part, when we're at conferences like this, and we're thinking about parenting, which we don't do very often, um, there's a very general sense that, like, I hope God's helping me. I hope that's the case, but there's, there's, for most of us, there's an image of God. There's a deep belief that like, yeah, but you know, God, God is involved with, with holy things, which, which in our minds, a lot of times that images, God is involved with like spiritual things. And he's kind of doesn't have a whole lot of patience for earthly things, for limited things, for messy things. And so I don't know. I, I know that intellectually that the driving of the minivan and the now a big van and then the changing of the diapers and the doing the dishes all the time is a path to holiness. And I know that that's beautiful. The idea of domestic church is beautiful, but man, it does not feel beautiful. And it doesn't feel holy because I have inherited in some form or fashion a Christianity that is somewhat dualistic or Gnostic, which means that like I some in some way see that like earthly things, humanly fleshly things is bad. Spiritual things is good. And the more I can kind of move in that direction, the better. The more I can get my kids moving in that direction, the better. So my kids, when they are crazy in church and acting like a three-year-old, means that somehow I'm not a holy person, you know, so I ended up being way more of a, of a tyrant than I should be and that kind of thing. Um, so all that to say that like this, this, this tension of like, it doesn't feel like a path to holiness. So how does God fit in? And that's what I want to attack today is how exactly does God fit into this? Where can we get access to him? What does it look like for him to be a part of this parenting process? So one of the things I noticed about myself and about all the other parents that I work with is that we tend to and our day-to-day -day lives, lean into those things that we're confident in. We tend to spend most of our time and our attention in the things that we feel like we can do well, um, where we feel like I can do this well, and when I do this, these are the fruits that come from it, and I have some control over uh, the, my success, my measurement of success, my, um, you know, my fulfillment of my, my role in this. So work is one thing that we lean into pretty heavily, whether even if I don't like my job, I can tend to lean into that heavily and spend more time there than I should, more of my mental energy than I should, because I know what success looks like, because I'm confident in my ability to, to achieve that. And if I'm not, it affects me in a big way, probably bigger than it should. And I think it has to do with the fact that I can measure that. Um, there's a confidence level there because if there's a simpler uh, equation of what success means and it's measurable. Uh, maybe it's it's exercise. Maybe if, if you're into exercise, that's something that like I'm... I'm <laughs> really spending a lot of time in because uh, I know what it feels like to grow here. I, I'm confident in my ability to, to attack certain goals and to achieve them. Maybe honestly, it's just social media. Maybe it's just a uh, social presence in general that we lean into because I, I can do that. I can host a party like a champ. I can get on social media and look awesome. I can get on YouTube and find a funny video really well, you know, whatever. And I think those are the things It's funny. If, if we look at our calendar or if we look at our screen time app and, tell us how much time we spend on what apps and, and our phone. I think it would probably be a shock, which is why I don't do that very often. <laughs> I'm not sure I want to see exactly where my time is being spent. Uh, but I think it's telling that we tend to lean into the things that we're confident in. And one of the things we are not confident in that we are afraid to fail at is parenting. That for the most part, I think for most of us, we're scared to fail uh, and we don't know how to succeed. Um, and so we tend to move based on fear and we tend to move based on self-preservation. So let's start with the fear part. We tend to move based on fear because I'm afraid of, of messing this up. That this is one of the tasks, if not the task, that I am most concerned about. Uh, the one that, I wanna, that I'm most afraid of failing at. And so fear a lot of times is what leads us. I know in our case, uh, my wife and I have had a number of conversations about like, okay, are we interacting with our kids in a way? Are we dealing with them in, in a way that like 
because we actually want to hear what they have to say, because we want to actually want to be in conversation, or because we want them to feel loved, right? And we're making our decision-making process because I remember at one point, and, and, and my wife's fine with me sharing this, but we had a conversation because uh, she was afraid that every time a kid said mom, if she didn't say yes, you know, that she was going to be damaging them for life, you know, <laughs> like she was going to have some sort of, uh, uh, because they weren't feel listened to and, and affirmed and that kind of thing. And there's something to them being listened to and affirmed and responded to. Um, but it, for her, was operating out of a sense of fear and she was overwhelmed. She had all these little kids. My, my oldest is only 13. So we got eight kids with one on the way. The oldest is 13. None of them are twins. So we got just a lot of little kids. And so they're always saying mom, all of them, all the time. And so if they're always saying it and she's operating out of fear, then a couple of things are happening. One, the assumption is I've got mom at my beck and call at any time and any place. And she owes me that. And number two, uh, they're going to, even at a very young age, they can recognize that mom's doing this out of principle and not because she actually wants to say yes, <laughs> right? The tone is very different and they can, they can catch it just like we were talking about earlier. So she wants them to feel loved, but what she feels inside is drowning. And she feels inside is like, stop saying mom. And I had to tell her, you just got to tell them, stop saying mom. Cause that's how you feel. Be honest with them. And then what we need to work on is our own levels of charity. What we need to work on is, do I actually care about what you have to say? Because that's what matters most, right? And that's the hard part, obviously. Um, we'd rather just kind of fake it till we make it. With little kids, you think you can kind of, you know, work it. But once they get a little bit older, they, 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 they can see right through it. So, um, so what happens is we're operating out of fear. We're operating out of a, of, a, of a fear of failure, which is draining. So if I'm operating out of a fear of failure, I'm not really confident in this. I'm taking shots in the dark parenthood is going to be draining that doing things that I'm not confident in that are extremely important. It zaps my energy faster than anything. So what happens at the end of the day is that getting the kids to bed is like a finish line that I'm going to be, do my best to be a good parent. But like, as soon as those kids get into bed, I can just blah, I'm done being a good parent. It's all done. I can finally just let it go. I've crossed the finish line. If they come out of bed, they come down the stairs. I've got like a bazooka and I'm like, get back in there. You know? So it's, it's, that's obviously an issue, you know, now there's certain other factors and we'll talk about that in a second, but if I'm operating out of fear and I don't have confidence, I'm going to be in survival mode. I'm, my energy is zapped. I'm just trying to get through the day. So what happens is the task that I know is the most important thing to me, I'm lacking in confidence and I'm just surviving the day. So what happens is my kids are getting the leftovers of the, I've been putting my energy into things that I'm confident in. I put my energy into work. I put my energy into my phone, put my energy into exercise, maybe or whatever, and maybe it's, I put my energy into, into social status and, and, and relationships with people outside the house. And then the kids get me in survival mode. And I think this is probably, if not the key, uh, and where God could or should or maybe is not, and where he should be and where we need him to be, is how do I take advantage of the fact that God can give me something I don't have? That what my kids need more than anything is not a limited parent. They need God parenting them. And then we've heard that a couple of times in the past couple of speakers that our kids are looking for God when they look to us, which is kind of unfair, right? Except that God has not left us to do this on our own. Now that's a great idea, but how do we take advantage of that? And I know for me, uh, one of the things that is a, there's a, a contrast between when I'm trusting and when I'm self-preserving. Self-preserving means that I am counting how much I have left to give. And there's a natural reaction when we're tired. Like if you think when you're physically tired, we start thinking, okay, how much of this tank do I have left, right? I've got a, a, a tank in my back that is my capacity to function. And when that thing goes empty, I'm dead, I'm zapped, I'm exhausted, I'm done. I can't get up off the floor. And so when I start to feel tired, I start measuring how much is in that tank. How much do I have left to give? How much of this can I, can I take? How much more of this demanding and, and, and fear and responsibility can I take? And when we start measuring, we start rationing big time. And I'm very guilty of this. Right, we ration how much we can possibly pay attention to our kids, how much we can love them, how much we can give ourselves to them. Uh, and especially as the day goes on, it gets worse, obviously, as our energy begins to wane. So that comes from counting the cost. Now, I want to compare that to another reality, and that is our marriages. So if I enter into marriage, our Catholic understanding of marriage, if I enter into marriage with the idea that, like, man, I want to be married forever, it's my greatest desire, I sure hope I have what it takes. That is actually an invalid way to enter into marriage. That, that kind of mindset is a mindset that says, I hope this works out, which means that I don't actually see marriage as a forever thing. They're like, I hope it is, 
you know, but I'm not sure what's in my tank and I'm not sure what's in her tank or his tank, right? And so what happens is, and we've seen this, you know, anybody who works with married couples has seen that like, if that's the case, when things start to get bad, my immediate response is how much of this can I take? How much more can I give? I start measuring how much I've got left. I start counting the cost and I don't know how much I can take as opposed to the idea, like we're never going anywhere. This is going to last forever, no matter how, and, and it's going to kill me until I'm dead. Like, this is how long it's going to, and so that, if that's the case, and like, it doesn't matter how much is in the tank. It doesn't matter how bad it gets. We're in this. And if that's the case, then I don't actually count. The measuring is not actually there. Um, honestly, the, the, the craziness and the difficulties and the suffering doesn't worry me as much because I'm not going anywhere and you're not going anywhere, right? And if it kills me, it kills me, but we're going to stay married until that happens. And there's a sense in which when that happens, the conflicts aren't as bad. I end up having so much more to give than I ever thought I could. That shortcomings in my wife become a, what I thought were going to be like a two month process and we can make her a better person so she could be a better wife to me. <laughs> Obviously a ridiculous way of thinking, but when we're first married, those are the kind of thoughts that go through our heads. It turns into a five, oh, it's going to take maybe a year. Oh, we're talking about like five, oh, 10. Oh, this is going to be there forever. Okay, well, that's the way it's going to be. So I'm going to work with that. And so I learn and I grow through that. My ability, my strength grows and my ability to give myself to her without expecting something in return and without expecting to be able to feel good about it all the time, right? So when I don't feel good about being a parent, when I don't feel like I can do this anymore, when I don't feel like I can, like if I sit on the couch, if my rear end hits the couch, I'm not going to be able to get back up again. And then I do. And all of a sudden I realize like there's three or four more things that have to happen tonight. Oh gosh. Okay. So then I got to get back up and go or something happens with one of the kids. And I'm like, I was not prepared to handle that level of chaos, that level of disorder, that level of discipline. You know, like I've got a kid now that's, that's in jail. Are you kid? I was not prepared for that. I've been doing my best to avoid that. And then here we are. Right. I've got a kid who, who was maybe sexually abused or something like that. Like I have been working my tail off to, uh, to avoid that. And here we are. So I don't know what to do. So here's the thing. You look at people, and we heard Mother Teresa's name mentioned. You look at somebody like Mother Teresa, who's basically a mother, not just to her nuns, but to every person she comes across, probably a better parent to the people that she finds on the streets than we are to our children, and for millions of people, and pretty much for the entire planet. How in the world, right? Is it that just that she had naturally more energy? Was she naturally built for this? Was she, you know, strong and, 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 and long-legged? No. She had little tiny short legs, and her toes were all twisted up, right? And she limped. So no doubt she was suffering. She didn't move around too well. Um, was it just that she had like a supernatural capacity to not think of herself? No, she's a human being. What you asked her, what she would say is I sit in, ad I sit in adoration for an hour a day. You should do the same, right? <laughs> That's all she'd say. And I mean, that sounds great. And I wish, I mean, obviously you and I could probably aren't in a position to do that. I know I'm not, right? At least not most days. Some days maybe if I try a little harder, but God has made it very clear to me that me trying harder me trying to be more of a Catholic hero, me trying to do more is not necessarily going to be the solution, that the solution is trusting more, that ultimately what trust looks like, okay, if God's going to help me in this whole parenting thing, what trust looks like is not that he's going to make it to where I'm suffering less, that I'm hurting less, that I feel less tired, because that's not going to happen. I'm not going to feel less tired, and I'm getting older, so it's only going to get worse, right? So I'm not going to feel less tired, but if I'm willing and able, right? If I'm willing to say, you know what? I have prayed for God to make me a better parent. I've prayed for God to help me actually love my kids and not just try to make them feel loved. I've prayed that I might actually enter into their world and not see them as burdens and just manage them to try to keep them out of the uh, out of sex, drugs, and rock and roll, right? That I've actually tried. I want to love them better, and I've prayed for this. Then when the time comes, and it's at the end of the day, and I had to get up super early or I was you know, up all night or something like that, at the end of the day, it's a hard work day, and I come home, and I feel exhausted. I've got nothing to give, and I have to make a decision at that point. That's where faith and trust hits. Am I going to count the cost? Am I going to measure how much I have left to give? Or am I going to say, forget it, I'm rolling. I'm just going to go, right? And if I collapse and die, so be it. But what I'm going to notice is if I make that decision, I get out of my car, I put the phone down before I get out of my car, and I go in and I enter in, and it takes everything I got then I see where God starts to carry me. 
And I could tell you, I, I have felt it where I just like, I'm, I'm taking a step and I feel like I'm taking a step off the cliff because I got nothing else. And instead of going off the cliff, I've got the energy to take one more step. I've got the energy to look one more kid in the eye, to squat down and talk to him instead of talking to him from, from way up high, right? I've got the energy to move in, the energy to, 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 to laugh and tickle instead of being like, sit down, you know, like I've got the energy to continue moving forward. It's there, but it's not there at first when I'm trying to measure and count the cost. And I'm, when I'm measuring and counting how much energy I have left, I can't actually get a sense of how much grace is also going to be there and put that as a part of the equation, right? It's got to be, I'm letting go and I'm trusting that God will be there. Now that has to be precursored by what? what I, prayer. <laughs> I've got to be willing to offer these things. Like God, you know that I've got nothing else, right? I've tried. I've tried. I got nothing. Else. I can't give my, no. This is going to be paired with something very important. It's also going to be paired with some discernment and some conversation with my spouse, right? So for instance, if, if one of the reasons why I'm so exhausted, why I'm having trouble entering into somebody else's reality, because my brain is exhausted, maybe it's because I'm spending time on my phone until like 11, 11, 11.30 at night, right? And maybe I don't know that because a lot of times we don't know how much time we're spending on our phone. We don't know how much we're, we're ingesting sugar or carbs, right? And it's causing us to be exhausted and get in these energy ups, ups and downs and that kind of thing. But you know who does know? Usually it's our spouse. <laughs> they could usually tell us exactly how much time we're spending on our phone <laughs> and how much maybe we're, we're not really doing a great job of, of being a good steward of our time and of our sleep and that kind of thing. So having a dialogue with our spouse and open and honest, honest conversation, I'm going to give some particular pointers as to how to do that well towards the end here. But like being able to ask them, okay, look, I, is what can we do to help maybe we maybe our schedule is not what it should be. Maybe the way that I operate is not what it should be. So having that conversation with the wife, but also taking it to prayer. Lord, show me some ways. What are some things, some things that I can change? And what are some ways that I just need to keep moving forward? Because I'm ready. I'm ready to not count the cost. I'm ready to just keep moving. I'm ready to trust that you will carry me when I think that I've got nothing left. All right. But if there's something that I can do, please reveal it to me. And I got to tell you, it, God has been very faithful to that prayer. One of the things for me is if I eat a bunch of pasta at lunch, by four or five o'clock, I want to fall asleep. You know, I eat a bunch of dessert, you know, with the rest of the people at the office, I want to fall asleep. So this is part of my, my, my physical digestion reality is a bunch of sugar and carbs is going to make me tired. So I've got to change my diet, which is not fun. But now that I know that this is a part of this project that I'm trying to work on, it's worth it. And I see the difference, right? I had some, uh, some friends and after them talking and praying through that, they realized that they had like five or six things every Saturday. So that weekends were not breaks. And so when your weekend is not a break, uh, it makes the rest of your week like just a nightmare. And you're looking at the rest of the week being like, how are we going to do this? I just haven't had a chance to rest because we've been doing five or six things and they're all good and they're all important. They're all, I can see the value of every little thing. But if I'm seeing the value of every little thing, right, then we're going to be zapped. And so they decided through their prayer that we're going to choose one thing every Saturday. We're just going to do the one. We're not going to do all of them. And that has made a huge difference for them. Uh, one of the other things, and I think probably the most important, is... We are also, if, we're, if, if we can be honest with ourselves, we're probably not fighting for the, primar the, the priority of our marriages, right? That is one of the things that zaps our energy as parents faster than anything. We're not fighting for our marriages as priority. Why does that zap us? Well, I had uh, some friends of mine and they, and they described it like this. They said, they're like, we feel like we are uh, two people living in the same house, taking care of the same pack of kids, right? Uh, because it requires everything we've got. They're 24-7, they're constantly demanding our attention. How can we possibly have time for each other? I would like that. It would be a luxury if we could have time for each other. Every now and then we go on a date, and that's nice. But the truth be told, we don't have the luxury of being able to spend time with each other. And I would say, and this is what we did say, and it was in a, in a retreat conversation, it's not a luxury. Right? Without this, you cannot do parenting. Without putting the marriage first, we can't do it. And one of the reasons is because we're not made to be teammates. Uh, we're not wired that way. As men and women, we come at the world totally differently. Uh, as men and women, we see reality differently. We process pain differently. We process love differently. We process uh, uh, all, all, everything that comes into our senses gets processed almost like oppositely in, in a lot of ways. And so like to try to be teammates, although it feels efficient, it's not efficient at all. God has not created us for efficiency. We're not machines. He's created us for love. And love means connection, unity, and relationship. He's created us to be one flesh. And it uh, turns out that's where our kids came from. Right. So if our kids came from this, a lot of times the assumption is, well, we, we enjoyed marriage for, for a little while, a couple of years, and we started having kids and we couldn't enjoy the one flesh union anymore, uh, whether it just be physical or otherwise, uh, that had to be put on the back burner. And the truth is, 
our kids, all kids, and this is ourselves included, our parents' unity is the source of our identity. And we know this, unfortunately, from the negative aspect and that when well, anytime you're working with uh, uh, divorced families, um, and, and if, they, if any of you listening have been through this, uh, yeah, the pain of this is very, is, is, is very, so what I don't want to do is to try to um, uh, talk down anybody or make this sound like a, 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 a critique or something like that. So we'll talk about that in a second. But the point is, we all know um, that if we can reflect deep enough that some of our deepest fears as kids uh, weren't necessarily like death or monsters, but what if, on the list somewhere was our parents separating. I remember having nightmares about mom and dad getting a fight and dad taking off or something like that. Um, and so when that does happen, the nightmare comes true, right? Um, and we see, and I've seen working with a number of youth and a number of, of, of couples in marriage and family that like the child would prefer mom and dad back together more than they would prefer a meal on the table or a roof over their head, right? That that's, that's very much the truth of that, that. The desire for mom and dad to be back together, which a lot of times the child comes across as kind of unreasonable, and, and, and uh, you know, emo overly emotional about it or something like that or overly attached to the relationship and I don't, I don't understand why. Well, it's because a child's identity is two in one. When I first read that in scripture that the two shall become one flesh, right? It's like, well, that's exciting. That sounds really cool in a kind of a hallmark kind of way. <laughs> but like, I'm over here, my wife's over there. We're not one body until I, we were pregnant with our first. And in that bump in her belly was somehow both of us and neither of us at the same time. And like mind blown. And then he came out and he's running around. The two of us have literally become one body. And there he goes. And now the two of us have become nine bodies, you know, and they're all over the place. And, and so that our, our children's identity and all of us, our identity, who we are is the union of two. And that doesn't change just because we're older now, right? It's, it's it, when, when you talk to, to adult children of divorce, um, it's, it's still uh, a serious problem. They may be already able to articulate a little bit better. Maybe they've grown to, to know how to live with that pain, um, but it doesn't mean it's any less pain. Children don't get used to that. It's like losing an arm or something like that. You just, you learn how to live with it, but you don't grow it back. So now again, just a word, if you are a single parent or if you are, have been through that process, um, God, Jesus literally came to earth and his main goal was to suffer with us, to literally die with us so that we would not be suffering and dying alone. One of the deepest sufferings that we can undergo is losing unconditional love, losing someone that we belong to that's supposed to be a forever family bond. And not just losing them by death, but losing them because of a choice that someone chose that this is not what I want to do, do anymore, be anymore, whatever. And so our, our very selves get just, just ripped to shreds. And so that is a pain that really, uh, it's one of those pains that there's a depth that really, really only God understands. And the good news is, is what I've heard from a number of folks who have been through this and have, have been able to receive a lot of healing is that the power and the ability of God to be powerful and healing and do wonderful things in that wound uh, is, is, is very unique. It's beyond compare in a lot of ways. That what God is able to accomplish if we allow him to and the healing and the power in the wound, not that he fixes and, and makes it to where it was before, but he's able to be in the midst of suffering in a way that most of us really don't understand because we haven't suffered to that degree. So just a word there, because um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about marriage. So going back to the idea that uh, we have to be united in order for our kids to really feel whole, that they need our unity more than they need anything, uh, because it's who they are. So what can we do? Well, there's a couple of things. Number one is we can fight for time together. Now, I know if, if, if there's a, a number of, of women on, the, on the, the conversation here, they're thinking, like, how am I supposed to do that? Right, I'm fighting for a million things. I'm supposed to also fight for time for our marriage. Well, good news, and I have sort of bad news, but the good news first is that men are naturally wired for this, right? God has, has made it to where men have a, a kind of a, um, a hierarchy of desires and focal points, right? And the beauty of woman, and I don't know for sure because I haven't studied this. I'm a, my master's in theology and I don't know anything else, but it, the beauty of woman is like, up there and like maybe number one, right? Certainly my experience and the guys that I've worked with, it might be number one. That the one thing that focuses us more than anything and causes us to say, I, I wanna drop everything else and, and do whatever it takes to, 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 to dive into this is the beauty of woman. And when we're married to one, we see beauty at levels that we've never seen before. And the more years we're married, the more capable we are of seeing that. And so the desire to fight for marriage is already there. Like I already wanna spend time with my wife more than I wanna do anything else. I wanna focus on her, I wanna love her, I wanna. I want to enter into that beauty. I want to be a part of that process more than anything else. 
And it's very easy for me to be like, kids, y'all go do something else. I'm focusing on my wife. And she's like, what? And I'm like, don't worry, we're good. They're not going to die. They'll find something to eat. They'll be okay. You know, and that's a natural thing for guys to do. Well, women can't do that naturally. That's my understanding, right? That women can't do that naturally. That actually Von Balthazar said that there is a, a, a irreconcilable binary focus in women that if they're a wife and a mother, they're focused on both husband and kids and they can't not do both. They can't just focus on one or the other, right? Which includes everything else that's going on in the house, which is why uh, when I was first married, my feelings would be hurt because I'd be like, all right, we'd focus on each other. And she'd be like, is that the baby? And I'm like, even if it is, she's going to be fine for like 30 minutes, you know? Or she's like, did I unload the dishwasher? I'm like, how are you thinking about that? Did I call my mom? I'm like, I don't know, you know? So, but the truth is like, that's not something she can control. That's just a part of the way she operates. And thank God, because <laughs> otherwise, if it was just man thinking, then we would be so focused that everything would be running up around us and we'd all die. Uh, but we'd be focused on our spouses. We, get to, we tend to be a little bit tunnel vision and we forget about the reality that's going on around us. Even sometimes the human, humanity of the situation, whereas our wives are very much wired to understand that kind of the whole in the picture, whole picture with all the relationships involved. All that to say that as husbands, we are wired to fight for time for this. The problem a lot of times what happens is that um, wives don't understand how they can possibly do that. And there tends to be a situation. It's like, how can you fight for this right now? You're wrong. This is not a good time, you know, whatever. And so what ends up happening is after a while, there's, there's a certain vulnerability in fighting for marriage, a certain vulnerability in saying, hey, let's focus on each other right now, right? And when she says, no, you're an idiot. This is a terrible time. After a while, that vulnerability, right? There's, there's enough a disappointment and the feelings of rejection and that kind of thing that he's like, all right, well, I'm just going to turn that off. I'm going to turn that desire off. I'm going to turn that focus off. And uh, you just tell me when you want to focus on our marriage. And what happens? That's not something she does very well because everything, all these different factors are all over the place and they'd have to line up just right to want to spend time focusing on the marriage. And so, and he's, he's kind of turned it off. So he's not a part of the conversation anymore. He's not offering his opinion on whether it's a good time to focus on each other. And so what happens is she's not allowing herself to be pursued, but what she wants more than anything is to be pursued. And she's been wanting that since she was three, right? But the guy's like, I, I, you don't want me to do that. So I'm not going to do that. So I don't want to hurt your feelings. I don't want to make you angry. So you just tell me when you want to focus. And now she's got one more thing that she's got to add to her plate. One more responsibility that she's got to carry. She's got to carry the kids and the house and now the health of the marriage. And he's like, just tell me what you want me to do. She's like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what I want you to do. I just, I want you to do something great for me, but I don't even know what it is. And he's like, that's crazy. It doesn't make any sense. I'll just be over here in the corner or I'll be out in the garage or something. So my point is as husbands, part of our prayer, I know that part of my prayer and part of my willingness to take on the image of God in a manly way, in a, in, a, in a masculine way, is to ask the Lord, give me the patience and the energy to continue to pursue my wife, even when it hurts, even when that vulnerability is not received well, even when it's received partially, that to not wait and somehow until it's, it's and to not turn it off, to not turn your vulnerability off, to not shut down my desire for her, to not shut down my desire to fight for her. Give me the perseverance. Give me the patience and the love for her and the appreciation for her and help me to have the courage, right? The courage to not turn it off and the courage to carry whatever pain it's going to take, right? Until I can reach her because that's what she wants more than anything. And that's what I want more than anything. And that's what God has created us for. And that's what our kids need more than anything. I've seen it so many times I'm working with, because I also work with the annulment process a good bit for a while. And the amount of couples who were either divorced early on or divorced once the kids moved out, um, it was more than anything is once the kids moved out, they were married for like 20 years. And once the kids moved out, they were like, all right, we're done working as teammates. I don't know if I ever really loved you. I don't even know who you are anymore. We're really bad at focusing on each other. And we try all these different huge issues that we haven't been dealing with for 20 years. And now on the surface, I'm not ready for that. I'm exhausted. I'm in my you know mid forties, whatever. And I'm done. And that's what happens a lot of times, as opposed to look, our kids don't just need us to take care of them. They need to experience the love of God. <laughs> they need to experience a love that is foundational, that is unitive. And the love of God is the union of three in one. And the image of God is the union of two in one that makes them the third, right? The, un the love of God, the image of God is an experience here on earth that our kids experience that here on earth in the union of mom and dad. So we have to fight for that. Now, another key here that can make this helpful, right? One of the greatest ways, if not the greatest way, to build marital intimacy and build marital unity is praying together. 
it was a, a study done and uh, Dr. Hackett you know, is probably going to be a little annoyed by this. I'm a lay person. I don't have to do the studies and stuff like that. So I just get to repeat stats that I hear. <laughs> I have no idea how accurate they are, but I'm assuming that the person who, who said it looked it up. So here we go. So there was a study done at some point, I think it was Pew Research, studied that uh, couples who go to church together, that, you know, the typical, you know, number you hear a lot of times is a marriage and divorce rate is about 50%. I think that's all marriages, not just first marriages, but anyway, about 50%. Couples who go to church together on a regular basis, it drops to like one in six, right? So like 16-ish percent, which is awesome. Couples who pray together on a regular basis, it drops to one in 1,105. Now, when I heard that, I was like, well, that's because you can only find 1,105 couples that pray together, right? When, we say, when I say pray together, I mean, like, my wife and I used to pray the rosary together, which is great. We used to go to adoration together, which is great. But truth be told, I might be like off in my own world thinking about the Spider-Man movie we watched last night, what it might be like to be Spider-Man or something like that. But she didn't ever know. And she's going to ask me, how, do I, how was that oration? Oh, it was good. It was good. And she said, you look like you were like locked on the Eucharist. You were in contemplative world. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I was, you know, I'm not going to tell her because I'm not even going to tell myself. I'm not even honest enough with myself to say you wasted a whole lot of time in there just being an idiot. You know, the truth be told, I know, though, that I, when it comes to prayer, I'm kind of like a fourth grader, maybe a second grader. And when we pray the rosary together, if we pray, if I pray the rosary and it's more than just me, my mind tends to say, well, some, I'm sure somebody's focusing, so I probably don't have to, All right? And I'm sure that I'm the only one who does that, right? In a mass, in any kind of communal prayer, <laughs> right? So, but that tends to happen. So I'm sure, what, you know, she's probably focused. And so I, my, my subconscious decision is to say, I'll let her carry the, carry the prayer. But all that said, even if we are focused and even if we are completely focused and things, great things are happening, how much access do I have to what's going on in her mind and her heart in that prayer, to what God is doing in her? How much access does she have to what God is doing to me? Not much, because I know that there's a weak person in there, and I don't really want to show that to her. And she's afraid to show that to me. I know a lot of times when we say, hey, couples ought to pray together. We're like, yeah, that's a great idea. I just don't know if we have time. You know, If I got time to go to the bathroom, I got time to pray together. And truth be told, uh, it's about the same level of priority, you know? It's, it's, it's a necessity. It's something we got to do because for the most part, I think most of us are, when it comes to prayer, we're kind of in solitary confinement. We've got this understanding of prayer. That's a purely personal thing. Whereas what happens in solitary confinement, we lose touch with reality because God made us in such a way that mentally, psychologically, we can't actually make sense of the world around us and what's going on by ourselves. We need to be thinking and processing reality with other people to be able to think at all. Otherwise we come unsprung. And yet when it comes to our spiritual lives, we're in solitary confinement. We're trying to reach out to a God that we're not really sure how to commune with. And we're doing it on our own. And we're wondering, some days I think I'm doing great. Some days I think I'm the worst sinner in the world. And a lot of days I'm all, everything in between. I'm not really sure what's God and what's me. And when God does say something, I'm not going to run around and tell everybody because they might think I'm crazy. So praying with my wife is going to be a very different reality, right? There's a vulnerability there that's not really, there's a level of vulnerability and intimacy there that's not in any other way experienced in marriage, not even in physical intimacy, right? There's a level of you're getting into my head and my heart in a way that is really doesn't exist anywhere else, even if I'm bad at prayer. And I think that's the, that's the hard part when it comes to couple prayer is that we say, well, we're coming from two totally different experiences here, right? That like he prays like this, I pray like that, or he doesn't pray and I do all the time or something like that. When the good news is like, it doesn't matter how different, it just matters that we do that together, right? And that we don't contradict. Okay. So if you can imagine, I'll talk about it. The, the fruits of praying together are that we both do it. We both hear each other, right? We both get an experience that this is good. This is happening. And when God does respond, we both see him respond. And I got to tell you, when we started praying together, God started responding in ways that I'd never seen before. It was almost as like, as if he was like, look, this is what I've been waiting for. I didn't just put you together to come to me by yourselves and then try to figure out how to throw ropes to each other across the canyon. I put you together so that you could experience me together. You imagine that experiencing God together, like God does something and you both see it. That's not actually that hard. All we got to do is both pray about it at the same time. We both pray about it. We both experience each other praying about it. We both lay it before God together. And then when he responds, we both see it. I mean, that there is nothing that builds intimacy greater than that. So not only do we hear each other pray in our weakness and in our whatever, and it doesn't have to be complicated, but we also get to see when God responds. There is nothing more intimacy building. And I've heard couple after couple talk about this. We did some, some couple prayer series, uh, some of the parishes that I've worked at. And uh, part of this domestic church thing is helping couples pray together and to help process what's working and what's not. 
And uh, for the most part, it's, it's a struggle, especially the older we get, the harder it is because you're dealing with what seems like a small change. Hey, just pray together. Just start praying together. Like, if, yeah, but you're dealing with like this freight train of a 20 year marriage and what seems like a small change, like you try to move a freight train just an inch. Good luck with that. It's hard. But when you do, buddy, look out. Huge things are going to happen. And this is what we've seen. Couples who are first married, maybe it'll start this pretty quick and pretty easy. And I recommend that. Don't try to change the freight train later. But couples who are married for a while, if you, if you, if this idea scares you, if you have trouble understanding this, the good news is it's not complicated. You just do it. The hardest part in couple prayer is just starting. Once you break through the ice and just start, it takes care of itself. And I, I even we've been praying together for years now, and I still am like, I don't really want to do that today. I don't know if I have the energy for that. I don't really want to be that open and honest with you right now. I just want to go to bed. But once I start, once we break into it and we start praying, I'm always so glad we did 100% of the time. Feel closer, glad we did it. And just starting, I don't feel tired anymore. You know, the, all, the, all the obstacles go away and it becomes something very real and very beautiful. So couples who've been, who've been together for a long time, we've heard them time and time again. We have never felt as close to one another. And it's only been a few days we've been praying together, right? And so they're able to continue this process and it's beautiful. Again, it's not complicated. This is not about techniques, right? One of the greatest advice I ever heard, a couple of prayer is not complicated, you just do it. That doesn't mean it's easy. It's one of the hardest things we, you, know, you might decide to do, but it's not complicated. There's not some special way to do it. Start simple, start super simple, but be honest and just be open. Rule number two, do not critique your spouse's prayer. If you want to lose your prayer partner like that, in the most vulnerable place that they are, be like, yeah, you're not doing that right. Right? Imagine critiquing after physical intimacy and that moment, how's that going to go? Right? You're going to lose your partner. You talk about close up and create, you know, walls and shell and that kind of thing. It's going to happen even more so with couple prayer, right? If, if, if wife is super spiritual, you know, leader guru and they start praying together and he prays and she's like, you know, like you're done, done. But if you can imagine he prays in the way that he does, which is super simple, super you know, without skill or knowledge or experience or whatever, it just is. And then able to just be that, the intimacy that builds from that and his ability to be free later on as it continues to grow, it's going to be amazing, right? And his closeness to her is going to be amazing because the assumption a lot of times is um, if my wife is, is, is super spiritual and, and, and she's kind of the, the, the one who takes lead in that, all that relational stuff, um, I'm just going to let her do that. And the assumption is that if I'm going to do anything spiritual, it's got to look like that. But number one, I don't want to look like that because it's kind of feminine. And number two, like, there's no way that took years and I'm not jumping on a train because it doesn't, it doesn't look attractive and I don't feel capable. So typically I'm going to move in the other direction. That's what usually happens in marriage. But a couple of prayer, do your thing, right? Do it out loud. I'd recommend be a little more simple. Don't get crazy, but like, let him do his thing. Or if it's the other way around, like it was in our marriage, let her do her thing and let her feel free in that and feel fulfilled in that and let her be safe there right? There's a safety and there's an intimacy when vulnerability is respected. Okay. Last thing, dialogue. This is huge. Until we were challenged with this, I didn't realize how little we actually talked about our marriage and our parenting. Um, we would talk about like in a, in a particular moment of something, something went down, some conflict happened. And, you know, I went off on one of the kids and uh, she thought that was a bad idea. She might like, after the kids go out to bed, she might be like, that was a little harsh. And I'm like, no one, you know, he needs it, you know, something like that. Uh, because it's in the moment and the emotions are there, they're raw, they're, 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 they're high. Or if in our marriage, there's something that's not quite working and there's something that a weight that I've been dealing with. If when the emotions are high, I'm like, I'm tired of this, right? Or she says, you know, you, 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 this is not going well. I don't want you to do that anymore. Like we're going to get defensive when the emotions are high. If we schedule a day, and I'm going to recommend once a month, we schedule a day once a month where we're going to talk about our marriage. We're going to talk about parenting because we want to be better at being married. And we want to be better at parenting. Then we go to that. The emotions aren't there. We're not in the context of the craziness. We're separate from the house. We're separate from, from a, even a restaurant. We're going somewhere just by ourselves for a couple of hours. And we're going to discuss how, we, how, we, how we're doing. Right? How you doing? How, you, how do you feel like we're doing? What's there? What's not there? The first couple of times, maybe kind of some big, heavy stuff. But after a while, we're just going to do some fine tuning be beautiful but the, the, the truth is if we don't take that time we don't ever talk about it when's the last time you talked about your marriage really when's the last time you said hey how are we doing as a couple <laughs> and i you know my first response when i heard that early i, I might have been like all the time we talk all the time 
I tell her all the time how I feel about her, and she tells me. Truth is, when have we stopped and said, hey, let's dig a little deeper? How are we doing? Because truth of the matter is, one of us probably thinks we're doing okay, and the other one's like, no, you're an idiot. You know, like that's typically what happens in marriage. Because one of us is carrying the weight, or one of us is kind of hiding, or one of us just assumes this is the way it's going to be. And we've kind of just settled into the fact that this is as close as we're going to get. I'd like to be closer. I'd like to. But this is not going to happen. Because you're limited in these ways, our schedule's limited in these ways, yada, yada. It's not going to happen. That is not what God has created us for. He did not create us to be teammates. It doesn't op- we can't operate that way. It's going to cause deeper and deeper division. Right? And we didn't, he didn't create us to just be sort of close. He created us to be an image of the Trinity, <laughs> where three people actually make one God. That's nuts. But that's the image of, that's, that's what we've been created to be. And not just to be, but to want more than anything. Like when I got married, I wanted to be like day one, I wanted to have the marriage of a couple who've been married for 50 years. I didn't know that at the time. I thought we were gonna just have it like that because the sacrament does magical things. Was it turns out I married a female and those are different from the males. And that's really hard, you know? But like, God doesn't magically just fix that. He allows us to grow in that. And it's the same with our parenting. But the point is, Our kids need our unity more than they need anything. And God wants our unity. And he wants to give us unity more than he wants to give us anything. Because that's actually going to prepare us for heaven. Because if he gives us unity, then it's going to train us to be like, I want to give everything without counting the cost. I want to give everything. I want to pour it out in the way that you provide for me to do. Because I now see, I can feel when you're with us. And when we talk it out. Right. I can see I can pick apart and I can I can make this a project, but I'm not even alone in doing the project because I can't see all the moving parts. When we pray about this, we ask you for help. When we ask you for help together. When we get together and hash it out under a microscope, you're with us and we can watch you moving things around. We can watch you providing and supporting us in this. And like I'm excited for what's to come. Am I limited? Yeah. Right. As, as the two speakers are speaking this morning, I'm seeing all kinds of things that I need to do better. But if I take that to prayer, that I'm not led by fear and discouragement. I take it to prayer and God says, I know, I know you're bad at this. I know I've been knowing that I know it better than you do, but I've actually given you these kids anyway. (laughs) I've given you this spouse anyway. And I'm not leaving you alone in this. You keep walking with me, right? You keep walking with me. Let me show you what I can do through your brokenness and your limitedness. And and you're never going to be good enough for these kids. Like I've definitely feeling like you're never going to be good enough for these kids. Right. I'm going to provide for that. Okay. And I'm, there's one guy, dad, he had a bunch of kids and somebody asked him I don't you, about being a better dad. He said, you know, I could be a better dad, but I'd hate to deprive them of the beautiful experience of healing when they get older. You know? <laughs> I'm not necessarily saying that, but what I am saying is that ultimately these are God's kids and he's given them to me to be a better dad too. And I'm not, I'm not up for the task, but he is. And if I can let him do through me, which is going to be more than I could possibly ask or imagine. It's not going to be perfect in the way that I can picture it being perfect today. But as over the course of my life, if I continue to walk with him, I'm going to be surprised at how much I can handle. Not only how much I can handle, but how much my kids are receiving what I didn't know that they were receiving. Because I'm just willing in each moment to say, all right, get up off the couch. Why? Because he's going to provide. Get in that kitchen and do those dishes. Why? Because he's going to provide. When you go in the bathroom to bathe those kids, don't just yell at them. Like get in there with them. Enjoy their presence because they're awesome. Not just because you don't want them to feel, you know, pressure you want them to feel love get in there and actually love them because you like them and they're cute get in there and enjoy that right which i feel like i don't have the energy for but i'm gonna choose it anyway because i know that god's gonna give me the energy when the time comes and he does right and if i'm not getting this because there's something about my schedule that needs to change and he's going to clarify that but praying together as a spouse as spouses when we schedule that couple dialogue once a month we're going to spend the week ahead of time praying right i might even go to confession so that I know and I've got the grace and he's going to lead that conversation the way that he wants to lead it. And then we're going to have what we need because God is with us in the mess. And I can feel him with us in the mess. And then I'm not measuring and I'm not waiting for myself to be perfect. And I'm not trying to do this perfectly. And I'm not lamenting that I'm not perfect. But I know that I'm imperfect. And I know that God is with me because I can feel it. Right? But it's going to require some fighting. It's going to take everything I've got, but not without hope. And it's not going to come from fear. It's going to come from a hope that says this fight is worth it because it is working and God's doing beautiful things. All right. Thank you very much.